So our next speaker is Cisco Gooding, a uh, postdoc at the University of Nottingham, if I'm not confused. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, nice. Cisco is going to talk about uh, vacuum entanglement from cold atoms. Cisco, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, this work is uh, based on a collaboration with Rob Mann and Silke Weinfurtner, uh, who's my supervisor at the Black Hole Lab in, in Nottingham, and also uh, Rob's previous PhD student, Alison Sachs. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right into it because this is a rather brief talk. Yes, sorry. Um, the basic idea that we're trying to implement experimentally is this entanglement harvesting protocol that a lot of people are familiar with in this crowd. Uh, it was mentioned in a couple of previous talks, both uh, uh, today, yesterday, and uh, Monday. And um, the components of it that we are going to care about for my purpose are basically uh, just this general interaction Hamiltonian to describe a pair of under DeWitt detectors. Uh, this is going to take place for a field in two plus one dimensional uh, space time, and uh, we're going to keep the space time flat uh, for these purposes. Um, the interaction Hamiltonian is based on uh, a combination of a smearing function and a switching function that basically tells you how long your interaction is and how spatially localized it is. And then uh, the usual combination between a monopole moment that describes the detector, J labels the uh, detector for both A and B, um, and phi is the field that we're going to be probing with these detectors. So, uh, and lambda is a, just a coupling constant for the front, just to mainly keep track of the terms in the perturbation series. Um, the monopole moment is a, a standard uh, under DeWitt type for a two level system. Uh, it just has these poly matrices for each of the two detectors, J equals A and J equals B. Um, so, this is just to set the stage for what we're going to be doing experimentally uh, in this proposal. Um, the harvesting protocol itself uh, has to, in some sense, be verified to determine whether you've uh, harvested a certain amount of entanglement or uh, how much entanglement you've harvested. Uh, for our purposes, uh, the negativity is going to be the quantity that measures that amount of entanglement that we extract from the field using these detectors. Um, it's a composite object that's based on the difference between mainly two objects. One is uh, the vacuum excitation, and this is for a a general trajectory uh, of your detector. This is just the response function. Um, but for us, it's going to be uh, non-zero, even if we have a stationary detector, uh, simply because we're going to restrict the amount of time that the interaction takes place. So we're going to get these switching excitations and whatever. Um, but it's a it's a basically the difference between this vacuum excitation and the this other quantity M that's related to virtual particle exchange between the detectors. Um, and this uh, quantity, that's the negativity that's built from these two objects uh, has the same form uh, for each of the composites. It basically is an integral over K space of uh, some Fourier transform of the smearing function and some other function G that uh, is given in general by uh, either a Gaussian or a modified Gaussian, uh, Gaussian with a, a Bessel function uh, for the case of the non-local term, the, the M quantity that relates to virtual particle exchange between these detectors. And you might notice that I've kept omega K uh, not uh, equal to C times K. Uh, I'm not assuming a linear dispersion relation because in the implementation that I'm gonna mention, the dispersion relation uh, is, ref is a reflection of the particular analog that we use to implement the system. So for instance, if I have a BC, I will have a Bogolubov type of dispersion that will uh, have a linear regime, but then uh, a modification at some higher Ks. And we're just keeping track of those uh, in order to accurately describe uh, the implementation. Um, so without further ado, the actual experimental proposal to 
finally get some observational guidance for this harvesting protocol um, is a generalization of another simpler experiment that I'm gonna uh, mention uh, very quickly here. Um, but the basic idea is we send two lasers uh, intersecting at uh, spatially distinct points, a two-dimensional Bose-Einstein condensate uh, that's um, trapped in, uh, in the vertical direction on this diagram. And the intersection points between the lasers uh, are just gonna be fixed. And the amount of entanglement in that effective vacuum field that uh, describes that Bose-Einstein condensate the entanglement that we get is going to depend on the distance away between these two points. And in particular, we're going to keep these points and the interaction time constrained so that the interaction is space-like with respect to the sound cone structure in the BEC. In the diagram, there are uh, red and blue beams. These are shown spatially distinct just for clarity. They're actually overlapping and they're a reflection of the fact that we have modulation in that beam that's uh, uh, provided by this in orange microwave oscillator that we send into these boxes are electro-optic modulators. They modulate the green laser signal that we send it, it also into them and produce these modulation bands and the point of that, uh, without going into a tremendous amount of detail, is just that they balance the Stark potentials on the BEC so that we don't destroy the BEC as we're probing it. Uh, they're, they're just intended for that. But they also have a nice added bonus that they allow us to extract the information about the BEC just from direct detection of that modulated beam. So we don't need to homodyne these. We don't need to go into to a, a complicated interferometric uh, setup just to extract that information. It comes, a lot, it comes out just from the modulation itself, which is really nice. And then uh, you'll notice that this microwave oscillator on each side is detected and then fed into a mixer that is used just to demodulate the information that we get from the photo detectors and provide a phase reference so that we can uh, have accurate control over the information processing that comes out of those detectors. So how exactly hard is this experiment? Um, there is a similar experiment that was performed uh, and uh, described in this paper, uh, this Nature Communications uh, from a couple of years ago. Uh, Albert Schleiser and uh, his collaborators basically did a similar setup where they take at the bottom there are red and blue beams and they send them into a, a cavity and inside the cavity is a single membrane and that membrane is the source of their entanglement. They entangle the red and blue beams that are independent uh, initially uh, through their mutual interaction with that membrane. Now for us, we have uh, a couple of differences between these. We don't have uh, overlapping beams. We're trying to have spatially distinct and indeed space-like separated interactions between uh, our two detector beams and the Bose-Einstein condensate that we're probing that serves as our field. Um, so these are slightly different setups. It's basically the difference between getting local and uh, global information. The experiment that was already performed uh, is a global uh, version. And we want to just separate these beams and, and uh, probe the local information that's determined by the distance away from those two points. Um, an important thing in this, uh, just very briefly, is the difference between uh, what these modes look like when you detect them from the point of view of either the local basis or the joint basis. Because we're worried about uh, how much entanglement we can extract from this, the joint basis is an extremely useful and uh, indeed uh, perfect uh, description uh, for that purpose. Um, and some things that look uh, harmless or unentangled from the local basis perspective can be shown in the joint basis to be indicative of entanglement between our beams. Um, and, and the uh, details of that really aren't uh, super important for this purpose, but the thing that is important 
is the uh, formulation of these joint variables in terms of the individual variables of the of the system. So if, if we have these two laser fields that we want to consider in both the local and joint uh, bases, uh, each of them has uh, an amplitude and phase quadrature for each frequency associated with it. And then we can consider the common and difference mode quadratures that are obtained by the sum and difference of those two individual beams. Um, a quantity that people might uh, be familiar with uh, from other contexts is the separability that we Come can in, Cisco. Yeah, excellent. I'm, I'm right at the end. Um, this is uh, a quantity that basically tells us what the squeezing in separate variances in these joint variables is like, is uh, telling us about whether we have entanglement or not. Uh, this is basically uh, just a sum of variances uh, for both the joint uh, sum variable of the amplitude and difference variable of the phase or vice versa. Um, and this is the quantity that we're going to use. Uh, it can be written in terms of spectral densities too, to determine whether we have entanglement in our system. Um, so just very briefly, the actual implementation uses ideas from this uh, recent uh, collaboration uh, of ours. Um, and it basically just takes the same analog detectors that we have there and makes two copies of them. It has the same modulation structure, except we're not going to be doing this other bit where we deflect onto a circular trajectory. Bill will be talking about that uh, later today. Um, just the very quick of this is we have a transformation of these modes in the, in the lasers, and they carry copies of the BC fluctuations in them. And the BC fluctuations come from the individual points on those two beams. That's going to be useful because we're going to correlate those two things. Um, this is just the Bogolubov transformation that describes how that interaction transforms the, the modes in those modulated fields. The details of this aren't, aren't crucial to the uh, point, but these are what those transformations look like anyway. And you can use them to construct EPR-like variables uh, for those dual beam uh, setups that are used to implement uh, the harvesting protocol. And you can express the inseparability condition in terms of those things also. And this is my final slide. Uh, I just wanted to say that those Bogolubov transformations for each of the individual uh, lasers that we're using as detectors to probe that BEC, uh, they have correlations in the outgoing photon fluxes that directly tell us what the Whiteman function is of that effective relativistic field in that plane. And so by correlating those two detected photo currents, you can extract information about correlations in that effective vacuum field, thus verifying experimentally the entanglement harvesting protocol and probing new features of it that are otherwise uh, either too difficult theoretically or not accessible in other experimental means. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Cisco. Uh, all right, uh, we have time for one question. Before we go, I see Masahiro, uh, but uh, before we go there, I saw that, that there were some questions asked on the chat here. I'm gonna ask mm -hmm. you because the questions on the chat get lost after we close the session. I'm gonna ask you that these questions, uh, if you could please ask them on, on Slack, um, because again, there will be no, it's nice for everybody to see and this will be lost the moment we close the session. Anyway, Masahiro, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, it is interesting. And uh, then, so can I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, can you expose uh, uh, energy cost of quantum and mm -hmm. entangled harvesting? So by using such a cold atom or BEC or other system, so it is it is very interesting if you can. Uh, measure directly the energy cost of uh, uh, entanglement harvesting. So can you do that? Um, that's an interesting question. I haven't I haven't tried to model it to check if that's possible. Um, in principle, 
possibly, but uh, I, I would have to check into the details a little bit carefully to, to get an a, a actual answer to that question. Okay, thank you very much. In the future, I, I will tell you. Very, uh, so in, uh, in the proposal, so if you were to do um, an experiment for in time harvesting in that setup, uh, could you, what are the time scales? Can you guarantee any degree of space like separation between the, uh, the two probes that are harvesting? Yes, yes. That's actually one of the main motivations for using these analogs because mm -hmm. the speed of light gets replaced by the speed of sound, which, you know, could be 10 orders of magnitude smaller. Um, it's still tricky to actually get the interaction time small enough even even to manage space-like separation with respect to that causal right. structure uh, but it's very doable and it's well within reach of current uh, bc experiments nice very nice thank you any more questions for anybody in this session well if not then i think we could end the session here and uh we reconvene in uh, 57 minutes uh, hopefully all of you can do it. I know that time zones are not nice to people in Australia, but uh, we will be recording everything. And uh, the next session is going to be chaired by, by Adam. So he'll be the one introducing the next session. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And I'll see you in 50 minutes or so, 57. Thank you.